Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Before, the boy and the girl had once dreamed of ships long ago before they'd ever seen the true sea. They were the vessels of stories, magic ships with mass hewn from sweet cedar and sails spun by maidens from thread of pure gold. Their crews were white mice who sang songs and scrubbed the decks with their pink tails. The Verhater was not a magic ship. It was a Kirch trader, its hold bursting with millet and molasses. It stank of unwashed bodies and the raw onions the sailors claimed would prevent scurvy. Its crew spat and swore and gambled for rum rations. The bread the boy and the girl were given spilled weevils, and their cabin was a cramped closet they were forced to share with two other passengers and a barrel of salt cod. They didn't mind. They grew used to the clang of bells sounding the hour, the cry of the gulls, the unintelligible gabble of Kirch. The ship was their kingdom, and the sea a vast moat that kept their enemies at bay. The boy took to life aboard ship as easily as he took to everything else. He learned to tie knots and mend sails, and as his wounds healed, he worked the lines beside the crew. He abandoned his shoes and climbed barefoot and fearless in the rigging. The sailors marveled at the way he spotted dolphins, schools of rays, bright striped tiger fish, the way he sensed the place a whale would breach the moment before its broad, pebbled back broke the waves. They claimed they'd be rich if they just had a bit of his luck. The girl made them nervous. Three days out to sea, the captain asked her to remain below decks as much as possible. He blamed it on the crew's superstition, claimed that they thought women aboard ship would bring ill winds. This was true, but the sailors might have welcomed a laughing, happy girl, a girl who told jokes or tried her hand at the tin whistle. This girl stood quiet and unmoving by the rail, clutching her scarf around her neck, frozen like a figurehead carved from white wood. The girl screamed in her sleep and woke the men dozing in the foretop. So the girl spent her days haunting the dark belly of the ship. She counted barrels of molasses, studied the cabin's charts. At night, she slipped into the shelter of the boys' arms as they stood together on deck, picking out constellations from the vast spill of stars. The hunter, the scholar, the three foolish sons, the bright spokes of the spinning wheel, the southern palace with its six crooked spires. She kept him there as long as she could, telling stories, asking questions. Because she knew when she slept, she would dream. Sometimes she dreamed of broken skiffs with black sails and decks slick with blood, of people crying out in the darkness. But worse were the dreams of a pale prince who pressed his lips to her neck, who placed his hands on the collar that circled her throat and called forth her power in a blaze of bright sunlight. When she dreamed of him, she woke shaking, the echo of her power still vibrating through her, the feeling of light still warm on her skin. The boy held her tighter, murmured soft words to lull her to sleep. It's only a nightmare, he whispered. The dreams will stop. He didn't understand. The dreams were the only place it was safe to use her power now, and she longed for them. On the day that Verhater made land, the boy and girl stood at the rail together, watching as the coast of Novi Zim drew closer. They drifted into the harbor through an orchard of weathered masts and bound sails. There were sleek sloops and little junks from the rocky coast of the Shuhan, armed warships and pleasure schooners, fat merchantmen and feared and whalers. A bloated prison galley bound for the southern colonies flew the red-tipped banner that warned there were murderers aboard. As they floated by, the girl could have sworn she heard the clink of chains. The Verhotter found its berth. The gangway was lowered. The dock workers and crew shouted their greetings, tied off ropes, prepared the cargo. The boy and the girl scanned the docks, searching the crowd for a flash of heartwinder crimson or summoner blue, for the glint of sunlight off Rovkin guns. It was time. The boy slid his hand into hers. His palm was rough and callous from the days he'd spent working the lines. When their feet hit the planks of the quay, the ground seemed to buck and roll beneath them. The sailors laughed. Var well, Fento men, they cried. The boy and girl walked forward and took their first rolling steps into the new world. Please, the girl prayed silently to any saints who might be listening. Let us be safe here. Let us be home.